Oh man, Wall Street is up to the same old tricks. You know, Wall Street's, they know a few tricks, okay? They're, they're like a, a magician who knows only maybe like two tricks, okay? But they know these two tricks and they know these tricks very, very well. And the great news for Wall Street is they have these down to perfection. They know exactly how to execute these tricks. They never go wrong and they almost always go perfect. And the great news for them is people keep falling for this so they can keep kind of doing the same trick again and again and again and people don't know you know they can't figure it out like oh what's going on here okay and in this video today i want to show you exactly kind of what's going on here what wall street's up to and the um the the trick that they execute perfectly every single time and people fall for this trick and they they, they like well, how did they do that i don't understand and it happens time and time again and it's going on right now once again okay i hope you guys enjoy this video as always okay so i want to start out here just looking at the august uh, jobs report here so 68,000 jobs created in the professional and business services field 48,000 jobs in healthcare, uh, retail trade 44,000 leisure and hospitality 31,000. obviously with the world opening up more and more this year you should expect uh, leisure and hospitality to continue to outperform Healthcare is going to continue to be a hot field for the next i would call it one to two decades and the reason being is we have such an aging population in the United States of America, this, we're going to need a lot more healthcare workers over the coming years, nonetheless. Okay, manufacturing is going to be something we're definitely going to continue. That, that's a that's a one to two decade trend there. The reason being is we're bringing so many different manufacturing jobs back to the United States, and uh, the the reason for that is it's, it's a two part reason. Okay, one is geopolitical risk. So you look at what's happening with like China, Taiwan, that whole situation, right? That's why the U.S. wants to get basically start producing all the chips that we produce over in Asia start to produce those in the United States over the next decade because if if something happens there we could potentially be cut off then all these massive companies that we have in the United States of America their business models could be hurt in a massive way which could affect guess what jobs which if everybody's losing their jobs something like that guess what that hurts politicians that helps the, that that destroys the entire United States of America right so that's going on also what we've seen is a supply chain mess right? We have learned through Rona on how much we are dependent upon, let's just call it cheap labor in other countries. And we've watched the supply chains get messed up. We've watched China do lockdown after lockdown after lockdown after lockdown and mess up the whole thing. And we've started to realize, oh my gosh, we need to start taking stuff in our own hands. And not just our politicians have realized this and, and the people in power and the CEOs of companies, but also just like business people in general, right? You know, I was speaking to a gentleman yesterday and we were talking about uh, sub-zero uh, fridges, okay? And uh, I was talking to this gentleman who worked for, for Toll Brothers, and he was explaining to me that sub-zero is basically about a year behind on production, <laughs> essentially. It's insane. And he was telling me because of a few little things are messing up the whole supply chain for that company, essentially, right? And that's what you have going on. And so, so many companies, politicians, CEOs, everybody is realizing, oh my gosh, we've got to start actually producing crap in the United States of America again or we are screwed in any of these other situations and i think rona took it up to the highest level and we have really realized oh my gosh we are so dependent upon these other countries we're in a lot of trouble okay so don't be surprised if manufacturing jobs keep coming back to the united states of america for a long time to go in the future Seventeen thousand jobs were created in the financial activities Sixteen thousand in construction construction could be a tough field in 2023 in my opinion if real estate does not get back on the right track these home builders have basically the rest of this year and into like Q1, Q2 of 2023 with a huge backlog of homes to be built. But if the new orders don't come in, expect job losses in the construction field in 2023. But at the flip side, the government could do some sort of big, uh, let's call it uh, infrastructure plan or something like that, expanded plan that could obviously give a lot of jobs out there. Social assistance, thir uh, 13,000 jobs there. Government, 7,000 jobs. Information, 7,000 jobs. Mining, 7,000 jobs. In transportation and warehousing, uh, 4.8 thousand jobs. Why is that number so low? Well, because of e-commerce being hurt in such a major way. And a lot of companies did massive hiring sprees in 2020 and 2021. And so that's just going to be a weak field for probably a, a good amount of time uh, now, nonetheless. Okay. Now, Ron Barron went on CNBC, um, you know, a f uh, basically a few days ago. And 
Ron Barron, I got a little respect for him as a, a money manager. I think he's obviously done tremendously well and built a you know an insane net worth for himself. But you know he was he was mentioning something very specific on the CNBC show, and unfortunately he only got to talk about it for like literally ten seconds. I'm talking like literally ten seconds. You know these shows are very fast paced, and so you don't really get to go in depth. Okay, and Ron Barron had mentioned something very specific that I thought was interesting. I wish he could have just spoke for like two minutes on this subject and really gone just in depth for two minutes. That's all I would ask for. Instead, he got to speak on it for 10 seconds. And basically what Ron Barron said is he said, all this inflation you see right now, this is all planned. This is all part of the plan. Um, and, and I wish he was just able to go in depth on that. But I thought, you know, I think about these things, right? And I know everybody, you know, it likes to play Monday morning quarterback and they think like, uh, you know, things are just happening because they're happening when a lot of times these things are planned out for reasons, okay? And so if you look at something like the debt, right? Uh, the debt is, is anywhere 28, 30 trillion, something like that, as far as those dollars go, right? And I was, I was like, let me just do some math. I, I wanted to see like, you know, on a relative basis, if we're trading very high as far as our debt goes or not, right? Because you can't look at this and be like, well, our debt was $4 trillion in 1946 and now it's uh, 29 trillion or whatever, right? And so therefore, it's some insane number because we know obviously the dollar's devalued over time and $1 in 1946 was worth a whole lot more than $1 in uh, 2022, let's say for instance, right? So I, I was like, let me do some math here. So I plugged in a calculator and I said, what's, what was $1 worth in 1946 versus what it's worth today, okay? And in order to equal $1 back in 46, nowadays you would need $14, okay? Keep that number in mind there. So let's go ahead and do math. And we had $4 trillion in debt in 1946, times that out by 14, right? Because that's what we need to do there. And that would mean our real debt in 1946 was $56 trillion dollars okay that was a real debt on an inflation adjusted basis there which i think is interesting because that's basically about double the number we currently have in this country even though everybody looks at it and they think it's such an insane number right everything's relative and especially compared to the dollar over time everything's relative so i just thought that was kind of interesting number to keep in the back of your mind because after that time period it's very interesting we, you know debt exploded right and after that right we have what is seen, and, and, and you know, if you asked me and you said, Jeremy, you know, if you could live in any time period in the history of the United States, what time period would you live in right now, personally? However, I feel like there's a lot of people that look at what happened after 1946 and through the late 40s and into the 50s and 60s, they look at that as the best United States of America ever in terms of quality of life, right? People look at that time period and they say, you could have got a home, you know, for a relatively affordable price. People could have a family, right? And that's when the baby boomer generation like went crazy, right? And, you know, just, people had a lot of babies. Um, you know, fo the, the other significant other, right, was able to be at home and you didn't have to work two jobs and a family. Everybody could have a car and these sorts of things. And so people look at that time period with a lot of like nostalgia, even though you know, most people didn't live in that time period. They look at that as a time of nostalgia, right? And meanwhile, you had the debt that went insane and you could have had a lot of people at that time saying, you know, we're doomed in this country because look at how much our debt has gone up, right? And so that's just kind of something important to think about that we went through what likely most people feel like was the best time in the United States of America. Isn't that interesting, okay? So Wall Street's up to their same old tricks again, okay? And this, this is like a game to get you to focus on other things, okay? So let's play this game a little bit. Let's say you were in the market and you were looking at my Model X and you were thinking, I think I want to try to buy Jeremy's Model X, okay? And I'll play the, the, the Wall Street guy, okay? And you can play the retail investor. And then be like, no, 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 you don't want to buy that Model X. I, you know, it's, I know it's a good deal, but you don't want to buy it. Here's a deal with that Model X. It's very low on battery right now. You'd be like, okay. You know, if you, if you thought about this for a second, you'd be like, okay, who cares? It's low on battery. I'll charge the freaking thing up. Like, that's a short-term thing. Who cares, okay? And I'd be like, no, you, no, you don't want to buy it also because the inside's really dirty, man. It's going to take you forever to vacuum it. You know, it needs a really good detailing. Nah, you don't want to buy this thing. You'd be like, okay, once again, that's another short-term thing. I can fix that. The car runs. It looks good. I can, I can buy this. I'd be like, no, no, no. Okay. Also, you don't want to buy this car because, you know, this tire has been really low on pressure lately. So I think I got to get that tire replaced there or all the tires. Also, we curb checked one time. So the rim got messed up right here. And you're like, okay, like, I don't 
care. Like, I still want to buy this car. It's at a nice discount. I want to buy this. I'm like, no, no, no. You don't want to buy this car. And you're looking at this and you're like, these are all short-term problems that I can get over this, right? And this is what Wall Street does with stocks all the time in a crashing market, right? Let's say you were like, okay, well, let, let me look at this Model S Plaid. And I'm like, no, you don't want the Plaid. It goes too fast. The steering wheel is a funky steering wheel. Nah, you don't want that thing. It's dirty on the inside. My kids put their, their feet up. And you're like, dude, all these things are short-term things. I can get over this, right? And I'm like, no, 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 okay? And this is what Wall Street does with stocks all the time. And in a crashing market, they will try to talk you out of buying an asset any way they can. And they're going to say this, they're going to say that. And when you start looking at these things and you just think about it practically for a second, you start to realize all these things they're pointing out are all short-term things that will go away. They will go away. Okay. And so no different than that car example right there, right? I just gave you a bunch of reasons that it's like, who cares? Like I can get rid of it. Like this is a bunch of short-term stuff, right? And so just think about that for a moment because Wall Street's doing that right now. They're telling folks, you know, don't buy stocks. Don't, you know, don't do these things. They're selling off these stocks at incredible paces, right? And getting you so caught up in a focus on the short term and all the short term worries rather than where these companies are going to be in five years from now, 10 years from now, right? You know, Shopify's got a beautiful situation going for the next 10 years, but Wall Street wants to get you to focus on all the things that are going bad for Shopify right now, right? Meta's got an incredible opportunity, is extremely undervalued, but Wall Street wants you to focus on the short term and oh, look at advertising business is weak right now, dot, 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 dot. They're going to go through all their different reasons and logic, right? That when you back it up, you realize this is all short term crap. And you could go through all these stocks, right? All these stocks. And it's the same thing over and over and over again. It's a bunch of stuff to get you to focus on the short term and all the problems in the short term to not get you to buy these things that are actually great long term values that are going to make you tremendous amounts of money over the coming years, right? And it's just, it's a trick they've, they've been doing for a long time and they're still doing it to this day, okay? You know, in the private stock group last night, I posted this in the breadcrumbs tab and uh, I was just running some rough numbers last night. I just was like trying to figure out the, you know, rough, uh, roughly the devastation that's happened so far this year. I said nine months in update on how much market cap stocks have lost. Many times we hear percentages, but sometimes it's interesting to hear the big numbers. These numbers may blow your mind. I just ran some rough numbers. NVIDIA's lost over, this was as of last night, they lost more now. Uh, NVIDIA's lost over $350 billion of market cap this year. Tesla has lost over $300 billion of market cap this year. Meta has lost over $450 billion of market cap this year. Netflix has lost over $150 billion of market cap this year. PayPal's lost over $100 billion of market cap this year. Shopify's lost over $100 billion of market cap this year. That's well over, well over $1 trillion of market cap just lost in those six stocks. Just in those six, okay? Now, imagine for the stock market in general, right? The stock market, the NASDAQ, just this year, is down over 26%, okay? Over 26%, uh, approaching a 27% downward move just this year. Think about the trillions upon trillions upon trillions of dollars of market cap wiped out from stocks, right? Some of that was probably fair and justified in some stocks, right, that maybe were overvalued, they needed a fall. But are we getting too far overextended, right? If you look on a short-term basis, maybe not. But if you look at any sort of long-term basis, yes, absolutely in a massive, massive way, okay? The, the trillions upon trillions of dollars lost in this whole situation is, it's a massive, massive amount, okay? Now, if we go back throughout history, something we do learn is, every, you know, you, you go through these time periods when there's so many short-term worries and this and that, but gosh, you've really gotta be out there buying and, and adding assets you love for the coming years, otherwise you're just getting played in this whole situation, right? When the, when the, when the NASDAQ fell under 1,000, you should've been buying. When the NASDAQ fell to 1,200, you should've been buying. When the NASDAQ fell to 2,600, 2,800, you should've been buying. When it fell to 4,500, you should've been buying. When it fell to 5,800, when it fell to 6,600, you should've been buying. When it fell to 10,500, you should've been buying, right? And so what do you think it's gonna be in this situation? You think we're gonna look back in five years, 10 years, and be like, oh, you know, shouldn't have been buying when it was 11K, 10K, whatever, right? Come on, come on, man. You know, a bet, uh, if you're not betting on companies during these, uh, let's call it tough time periods, when you're in a bear market, crashing market, whatever, you are betting basically against the United States of America, which is a, let's just call it a 
very dangerous bet, and it's usually the most dangerous bet you can make, okay? And so that is just kind of something to keep in mind. I'm kind of one of those that looks at the, and I said, you know, I'm willing to bet on the companies I believe in for the long term because I think these companies are going to thrive, and I'm willing to bet on the United States of America because, you know, it's, uh, you know, a lot of people have tried to bet against this country the last few hundred years, and, you know, they come up on the wrong side of it every single time. So maybe this time is different, and maybe all our companies just keep sinking forever and ever and all of eternity, or there's just going to be another short-term blip on the radar that in the future, the thing is, you know, when we go through these crashes, they, they hurt, man. They're very, very painful. But when you actually just back it up and you look out 10 years later, 20 years later, 30 years later, they were just blips on the radar. So I know this is hard for people to wrap their heads around right now in 2022, but what we're seeing in 2022 is just going to be a blip on the radar 10 years, 20 years out. Think about that for a moment. It will just be another blip. The, the, the Rona crash was insane. The Rona crash was the fastest stock market crash in history. I went through that. Many of you guys went through that, right? It was insane, like literally insane. And all it ended up being was just another blip on the radar. Think about that for a moment. Isn't that incredible, right? And so when you're in the moment, it feels horrible. It feels awful, and you think it's the end of the world. But then when you back it up, and you realize, oh my gosh, man, all it was was just another blip on the radar, and I should have been out there buying, right? And people look back throughout time, and, and they wish they had been buying during those time periods, but they don't buy many times because either they're not in the financial position to buy, or they're too scared because of all the bad news going on, right? You know, there were people selling stocks at, you know, NASDAQ 1300, 1400. Because it might go to 700, right? And, and, and I'm talking about in the 2008, 2009 crash. And going through all these reasons on why it should go down even more and go down even more. And how do you think the market got down that much? Because so many people were putting so much selling pressure, Wall Street specifically. And gosh, you should have been out there buying, right? And that goes for every single one of these crashes ever. You should have been buying out there, right? Now, also, if you didn't know, there's a massive drought. When Future told us it was a drought, we didn't know it was this big of a drought, okay? Chobani with, is withdrawing their IPO plans. There's been like no companies going public, basically. Like the IPO market is dead. SPACs, all those sorts of things are dead. And those are going to continue to be dead for the next year, essentially, okay? Now, the reason this is important and actually good for the stock market is now you don't have to worry about, at least for the next year, if not a couple of years, of because people are, you know, a lot of these companies are going to be very uncertain. Even when the market starts to really come back in a real way, companies are still going to be very concerned about, is it, is it real? Like, should we go public? And these, these plans, they have to be, you know, started like six months, nine months, 12 months before a company even gets to go public, okay? So the market would have to have confirmed like upside, right? Plus, then companies got to start planning it all. I mean, we could be looking at one to two years before the IPO market starts to get rolling again, okay? And so this means essentially that investors have a smaller pool of companies to basically invest in. You don't have to worry about this new company that's going public over here sucking a bunch of money out of these other stocks that you might own, right? And this is something I always thought about, like especially when big companies go public. When, when Alibaba went public, for instance, that took a lot of money away from other companies, right? Because people wanted to buy the, the Baba. When Coinbase went public, massive company. It took away a lot of money from other stocks, let's just say, for instance, right? When Meta went public, when Uber went public, especially those big dog companies, they steal money from basically the other companies because people sell out of other stocks because they want to put it into this new IPO. We don't even have to deal with that for at least one to two years, okay? And depending upon how bad the whole situation gets, it could be three years, but I think, uh, you know, a good like one to two years until we have to you know, worry about all these companies going public and things like that. So that's good for, for the market in general, okay? Now, when it comes to the wall of worry, there's one new thing I should add to the wall of worry, and it's China-Taiwan. It's absolutely a real thing. It's absolutely a worry, okay? But sometimes you got to ask yourself, is it an irrational worry or is it a real worry, right? And with China-Taiwan, that's always kind of been a worry, and it's still a worry today, right? And so you can't kind of plan your investments around something that might potentially happen because there's so many things that could potentially happen all the time. Oh, my gosh. You might end up, like, never <laughs> investing in stocks because there's so many problems all the time, right? Uh, the, the whole Russia situation... That, that's just ongoing. Valuations have come down massively. It's not even an issue anymore. Crypto's come down massively. Um, the main problems with crypto are already in the past now. Crypto could continue to go down for the next few months, but it, as far as the big systemic problems, that's in the past now. Earnings, 
we're here, I've, I've listened to a lot of earnings calls, guys. And what I've been hearing from actually several different CEOs, even from like Lululemon, from companies like Atoll Brothers, I've heard this from several different companies, basically. They've been saying that July and like August numbers have been actually trending up for some of these companies. So there's a thought process that earnings are going to have to continue to get worse. But I'm actually hearing some companies say some good things about kind of how August numbers have trended. So it's just interesting. And that kind of leaves me in a, in a state where I'm like, you know, I have, have the worst kind of is the worst behind us when it comes to earnings. It very much could be if, if business is starting to come back for some of these companies simultaneously you're in a situation where a lot of these inflation pressures are starting to wane for companies you could end up looking at companies in 4q and in the 2023 that could potentially beat eps numbers and beat margin numbers considerably there's several of my stocks i personally own that i think are going to blow away eps numbers and come in with way better cash flows and net income numbers in 2023 than anybody's expecting on wall street there's several of those stocks because you know for some of these stocks commodities have come down massively and some of their biggest input costs or some of these commodities transportation has cooled in a massive way and looks to continue to cool so i'm looking at some of those sorts of things and i'm like okay we're on we're on the right track we're not out of the woods yet but things are trending at least in the right way and that's an important factor that no one's factoring in right now okay inflation worries you know we inflation wouldn't have gone so crazy if it wasn't for russia in that whole situation but because that happened inflation went back through the roof again because of obviously oil and gas went to the moon okay and that hurt transportation costs that hurt obviously the raw price of, of oil that hurt the raw price of of obviously natural gas and um that's what made inflation numbers go to the moon okay and plus a, a speculative bull cycle in commodities it you know basically in the front half of 2022 that made inflation numbers go to the moon okay now we're going to be in a situation where inflation numbers is going to come down and come down we're going to continue to have inflation in future years but it's going to come down in a substantial way that's a whole you know and if people are still talking about inflation they're going to keep talking about inflation in the next few months that you know move off of inflation that's old news now at this point in point in time as the guy that was calling out inflation way before wall street was and way before uh you know cnbc or anybody was even talking about inflation i was talking about this in 2021 and how big of a problem this was going to be as the guy that was calling out that forget about inflation now that's old news we're moving past that okay the wage spiral good luck with that you know i think wages should continue to go up i don't think that would be the worst thing in the world but people think it's going to get out of hand um don't underestimate companies and their power. Recession, okay? Uh, recession, it, it's on the table. We're likely in recession right now, but no one knows how bad. So that's just like another irrational worry. Like, you know, because every single year I've ever been in the stock market, we worry about recession. We're like, oh, you know, it could be a recession this year. Or it's going to be a recession this year. Or there's 50% odds we're going to have a recession this year, right? There's always worries about that. So you almost can't even worry about that too much because you kind of get into irrational anxiety fears about recession recession how bad is it going to get you know however that's going to play out is however that's going to play out uh macroeconomics a very hard thing to predict and even folks that focus on this full-time have a lot of trouble predicting that never mind monday morning quarterbacks okay you know there's a great saying some of you guys might have heard this before the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago the second best time is now and i always look at this with stocks i'm buying right and you know, I, I think, man, I wish I was buying stocks 20 years ago. Unfortunately, 20 years ago, I was like 12 years old. So I wasn't buying stocks then, but I wish I was. I really do. Um, you know, I, I always look at those sorts of things. But, uh, you know, for all you guys out there, like, you know, what, what do you think is the great time to buy? Like now's the great time to buy. This next six months is a great time to buy. Um, plant the trees now so those trees grow up into these mature things. You, you keep waiting and waiting and waiting. And, and you keep wondering, like, why aren't my trees growing? It's because you aren't planting any, man. So how are your trees going to grow? And, you know, it's it's hard work. Let's just put it that way. It's hard work when you are it's hard like mentally right when you're investing into a crashing market a bear market whatever right it's very it can be very draining for investors it, but the thing is in life that you got to understand is nothing in life that ever you ever want results with comes easy it's always work man it's always work you know i take it back to myself this is a picture from me in 2016 i was um in my opinion not in the best of shape i was probably in some of the worst shape of my life i think i was up to like 230 pounds or so which for me is is not ideal and um 
you know, I, I wasn't, I wasn't, you know, proud of myself definitely when it came to kind of my, my physical situation. And, uh, I had to put in work and it was a lot of work and it was hard and it was not easy. Right. And so no different than working out. We we're in, a, we're of the understanding that if you want to get in better shape, you better, you're going to have to put in hard work. It's going to be mentally draining. It's going to hurt. It's going to be painful. Okay. Same thing is with the stock market, right? Anything in this world that you want, and especially if it's a big something, right? You want to get in really great shape. You're going to have to go through a lot of pain to get in really great physical shape, right? You want to, uh, let's call it, be in a great mental space. You better be prepared to do a, a, a lot of mindful meditation for a lot of nights to get into a great place mentally, right? And that's a lot of work. If you want to have a big stock market portfolio over the coming years, you've got to put in a lot of work. It's a lot of work and it's a lot of, uh, you know, mental draining, right? Of like, you know, investing and, you know, you, you can feel dumb because your stocks are going down in a bear market, a crashing market, right? And you're not timing it out perfectly. Don't worry about that. As long as things are going where they're going over the next five years, it's all that matters. This whole short-term game. You want to make a big income. Man, you better put in the work. It's a lot of work. You want a big income. I never, I haven't known personally anybody in my life that got to a big income where they're making a half million dollars a year or a few million dollars a year or something like that. I didn't grind and, you know, work intensely for years to get to that point. Okay. So that's the bottom line in life and the stock market's no different. You're not going to get results in the stock market by having it easy. That's just not the way it works. You know, you can get lucky if you were in some crazy bull cycle that we were at the very end of 2020 and into 2021. Right. But most of the time it's hard work and there's going to be some times when you start to see the results and you're very, very happy with yourself. Right. But that takes time. It doesn't happen overnight. It's like expecting to go to the gym and you do one workout and you think you're going to have a six pack and your, your arms are going to be pumped. Like doesn't work like that, amigo. And, um, you know, I just think that's important to understand. So yeah, hope you guys enjoy this video as always. I appreciate you spending your time with me here today. I appreciate all of you that are subscribed to the channel. Thanks so much for being here. Also, we got a epic, massive flash sale coming up on the Become a Master of the Stock Market course that is uh, literally just a couple days away from uh, going online. And uh, yeah, it's gonna be a one day flash sale. It's gonna be absolutely epic. So if you want that deal to receive that deal, my number one course ever, uh, basically check out the pinned comment down there and uh, enter in your email. And as soon as that deal drops, we'll send it over to your inbox for that flash sale. Much love as always and have a great day. Day.